Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And uh, I've been wanting to get on this subject here for, for some time already since the passing of uh, Congress's uh, bill there to criminalize uh, anti-Semitism. And before we go there to Chuck Baldwin in a broadcast that he did, uh, Republican Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene, who did not sign the anti-Semitism bill, God bless her heart for not doing that, uh, posted Congressman Mike Lawler, uh, the, the man that voted for it, and of course, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly what all he has to do with this there, but let me just play for you his uh, excitement over this bill passing. Hey everyone, it's Congressman Mike Lawler. I just want to say how proud I am that my bill, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, just passed the House of Representatives 320 votes to 91. This bill has broad bipartisan support and will begin the process of cracking down on the anti-Semitism that we've seen run rampant on college campuses all across America. This Notice on college campuses all across America, of course, it's not limited to college campuses just across America. Uh, this bill, of course, is going to criminalize uh, biblical passages. If you remember uh, the debate that we had with Michael Brown, my wife, uh, mainly uh, spearheading that debate over the Noahide laws. Uh, you know, those are the Education Day uh, that's signed by every president every year. And now we have the anti-Semitism bill. And of course, it's targeting campuses across the country, all because these uh, students are speaking out against the genocide that Israel is conducting inside of Gaza. You know, it's one thing, even though I do not agree that October the 7th uh, was fully conducted by Hamas. It was certainly uh, funded by Netanyahu, who insisted on funding uh, Hamas in order to make sure that the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, never gained power and they could not ever create a two-state solution. Not to mention the disarming of all the settlements that were done, that was uh, conducted there uh, just weeks prior to Hamas's attack. And the fact that Israel knew for a year in advance that Hamas had been planning and staging and preparing for this attack that would come against the Jewish state. What about moving the soldiers away from the fence as well? And all the different people in Israel, military, former military, that came out and said this was an inside job, including Rabbi Mizrahi out of New York, an Israeli-born rabbi, that knew clearly this was an inside job, as he had found out from former intelligence officials. Not a mouse could touch the fence without Israeli tanks and troops everywhere around, according to what he said there. Well, never mind that. Oh, we had October the 7th after all, and Hamas was able to take and just devastate Israeli civilians and take scores of hostages back into Gaza. Well, that did give a pretext for Netanyahu to conduct a war against Gaza and basically to level it right to the ground. That's exactly right. Gaza was raised, and according to what we're hearing now, it'll take at least 80 years to rebuild Gaza. 80 years. That's how much devastation has been done by the Israeli military and some, oh, I don't know, getting close to 40,000 dead civilians as a result of the war against Hamas. Over 15,000 children have been killed, all in the name of going after Hamas. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Well, it definitely makes me wonder. Anyway, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she posted this on her Twitter feed here, showing that this anti-Semitism bill would also target Christianity using the symbols and images associated with the classic anti-Semitism. Claims of Jews killing Jesus are blood libel to characterize Israel or Israelis. So free speech of being able to say what the Bible actually says is off the table. Sorry, you can't quote the Bible anymore. After all, you can't say a single thing, even though Jesus did in Matthew 23. Mind you, let me, let's just take a look at that so that you realize what this anti-Semitism bill has done. This anti-Semitism bill has now made Matthew 23 a violation of the law itself of anti-Semitism, right? Let's just go down and take a look here, right? Jesus saying constantly, thou blind Pharisee, cleans first, 
uh, that which is within, within the cup, that the platter outside of them may be clean also. We continue on down. When he says to them, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of them you shall kill and crucify, some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may become all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel and to the blood of Zechariah, son of Bacchaeus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. He indicted the Pharisees for the murders that had been committed from the very time of Cain and Abel all the way to the present time that he was living in. That would be anti-Semitic to make such a statement. And as Chuck Baldwin points out in his interview here, let's listen to a little portion of what he has to say. 2024. Dr. Stephen Jones wrote a short missive entitled, Congress Criminalizes Portions of Scripture. Let me quote Dr. Jones. Yesterday, Congress passed what is called the Anti-Semitic Awareness Act. It is a bill which criminalizes any criticism of the Israeli state or Zionism. It also criminalizes any Bible passage, such as Acts 4.10, which states that the Jews crucified Jesus. And because the bill assumes that all Jews are Zionists, it confounds anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism. Now let me quote Acts chapter 4, verse 10. This is the word of God. Simon Peter, the apostle Peter, is the speaker. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. The Congress of the United States has criminalized the word of God. There's a little portion there. I'll include the, uh, the link for Chuck Baldwin's uh, message that he shared there on this, about a five-minute message here on the Liberty Fellowship MT on YouTube. Check it out. I've known Chuck for many, many years. Uh, a wonderful man. He's been on here with us before. Very outspoken. Like myself, he was a Zionist at one time, very pro-Israel, only to wake up to find out what the truth really was in Scripture and that uh, bringing about a tremendous amount of change with him. Uh, you know, another interesting one, too, Daniel McAdams posting a, I believe this was a 2018 or 2019 Trump uh, uh, speech here. I want to play this here. And this here just goes to show you how much, how much Israel owns candidates, regardless, Republican or Democrat. That's why you can get bipartisanship uh, sponsorship together when it comes to something uh, where Israel is concerned. Listen to what the former president had to say here. Evil anti-Semitic attack is an assault on all of us. It's an assault on humanity. Now, granted, keep in mind, he is talking about the Poway attack that happened. And I certainly do not condone the attack that was done on the synagogue that left people dead, that left Jewish people wounded. I am definitely not in support of that. But I am definitely not in support when the President of the United States goes to raise what he's going to say here in just a moment about anti-Semitism. Uh, because, listen, it's a crime, period. If it's the same crime committed against a synagogue or if it was considered, uh, committed against a church or even a mosque. What's the difference? It is a crime and would be punishable because oh, whoever carried out the crime, they could easily be tried for murder, attempted murder. There's all kinds of charges that could be placed there. Even hate speech, hate crimes, etc. But we got to throw in an extra one just for Jewish people. Well, I come from a Jewish family, so, uh, you know, I, I don't see the need for it. 
especially in light of what Trump's going to say next. And that, again, is another example of Noahide laws. So will he get back in power? Most likely he will. Because believe me, they want him to pass what he's going to say here in this speech. It will require all of us working together to extract the hateful poison of anti-Semitism from our world. He's reading his script that he was this given. This was an anti-Semitic attack at its worst. The scourge of anti-Semitism cannot be ignored, cannot be tolerated, and it cannot be allowed to continue. We can't allow it to continue. It must be confronted and condemned everywhere. It rears its very ugly head. We must stand with our Jewish brothers and sisters to defeat anti-Semitism and vanquish the forces of hate. That's what it is. Through the centuries, the Jews have endured terrible persecution, and you know that. We've all read it. We've studied it. They've gone through a lot. And those seeking their destruction, we will seek their destruction. Never mind Palestinians that have murdered little children, mothers. By the way, when you have crimes the Israelis like say this, they're animals. Whether it's this one or another one or another group, we have to bring back the death penalty. There you go. They have to pay. He says we price. have to bring back the they death penalty. They have to penalty. pay the ultimate price. They can't do this. Just for anti-Semitism. Got to bring back the death penalty. That's Noahide laws. If you violate any of the Noahide laws, that's including you claim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you're to be put to death. So you just heard it from the former president's mouth. You know, I'm so proud of Abby Martin, though. I want to show you what she brings out with Piers, uh, uh, on Piers' program. In fact, some of the most... About the evils that are being done to the civilians of Gaza, the children, the women, even the men, for that fact, that have nothing to do with Hamas, but are just slaughtered beyond belief. You know, the war could have been conducted. Let's, let's give for a minute benefit of the doubt that there's not somebody inside the government that was behind this, uh, allowing this attack to happen on the innocent Israelis. Because believe me, the, the Israelis that were killed were definitely innocent. I agree with that 100%. But who was the ones that were really behind the attack? That's the big question. But let's just say for argument's sake, that it really was that Hamas was so sophisticated and had no funding from Netanyahu and they were really able to carry out such atrocities. Did you really have to kill more than 15,000 Palestinian children, little children in Gaza, just to get to that Hamas group that you're after? No. You see, the most of the deaths occurred from carpet bombing the entire city. It also occurred from telling the people of uh, Gaza that this area here is safe, you should go there, and then bomb the living daylights out of that area that you just called a safe zone. Everything was done so intentionally. And the war could have been conducted, it could have been done as a ground assault and rooting out Hamas, and that would have greatly minimized. Yeah, there would have been a lot of civilian deaths. No doubt. And there would have been a lot of Israeli deaths as well, and that was what I think Israel trying to avoid is Israeli deaths. But it could have been done. And they could have rooted out Hamas. And far less casualties would have occurred as a result. And then the world would have been behind Israel in what they were doing. But why did the Israeli government decide to just totally lay waste to an entire city? And then to also make sure you come up with the anti-Semitism bill here in the United States so no one dares speak out against your crimes. Listen to Abby Martin, what she says about it. It was heinous 
war crimes in modern history, Piers. And as we're seeing the invasion now of Rafah cutting off the last vestige of escape for Palestinians, the last vestige of, of aid delivery, 1.3 million Palestinians, including 600,000 children, with nowhere left to go. This is what Palestinians were told was a safe corridor. That is why they all fled to Rafah. Rafah has been bombarded for the last several weeks, killing dozens of people every day. So I think at this point, six months into a genocide, to be deliberating whether or not Israel should continue with this onslaught, this military operation that will result in mass slaughter to continue their ethnic cleansing of Gaza is frankly absurd, patently so, considering what we've seen them do just in the last several weeks, peers. Evidence of summary executions of doctors, evidence of mass graves, hundreds of bodies bound, dozens of men, women, and children bound, evidence, according to the UN, of Palestinians buried alive, using drones to lure out Palestinians with sounds of crying children so they could be shot and killed. I mean, this is unparalleled in modern history, actually. And the devastation that's occurred in the Gaza Strip, according to the UN, will take 80 years to rebuild without conditions. So at this point, Israel needs to be stopped before they continue this horrific onslaught, Piers. I, I do, for the first time, I give Piers Morgan credit for not interrupting Abby Martin. I know before she was on with an interview with him, he kind of interrupted her quite frequently. Uh, but this time she was able to get this out. Thank God she did. Uh, thank God for her courage to speak out what she just spoke out about there. Uh, and, and sadly, though, so many uh, people like this, though, like Piers and others, you know, they have, are so controlled by their media uh, backers that they're not, they're not allowed to dare have the courage like Abby Martin does. Uh, so very, very sad. This also I found interesting on Israel National News, imagining a world without anti-Semitism. In this utopian world in which Jew hatred was nothing but a bad memory, Hamas would have no reason to exist. Instead of building rockets and tunnels, the residents of Gaza could turn their colossal enclave into a paradise with a bustling economy and a high standard of living. That's what the op-ed is going to speak about. This utopia as so to speak there, but they don't bother to tell you the oppression that these people have been under long before Hamas ever came in, long before the rockets began to be built. They don't bother to tell you how that the very Palestinians that were saving the lives of Jews from the British who were rounding them up just before the War of Independence of 1948, they don't bother to tell you that these same Palestinian families were hiding Jews from the British and protecting them. Only a few days later, when the War of Independence began, they began to be slaughtered by the very same people that they had protected. Just like in the case of Sederot, where they were driven out and driven down to where Gaza is today. Just another land grab. And sadly enough, many of these Palestinians are crypto-Jews from descendants of the true Jews of the uh, Roman occupation back in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. It's no wonder when I brought the message out the other day and I shared with you that, in fact, let me just share, let me, let me pull this up for you real quick there because I think it's important that we actually bring this back to the attention of everyone here because I, I really find that it was an amazing insight that God had given me when I shared this message here. Uh, think to think, thinking to change the times and the law. It's not who you think it is or, or what you, know, you think it is for that matter. All this time, we have thought that the one that's going to change the times and the law, maybe it was the Pope of Rome. I mean, I've even been on the same bandwagon, blaming the Pope of Rome. I never really went for the part about the changing the Sunday to, uh, from the Sabbath to the Sunday law, which is very common amongst the Seventh-day Adventists. And I'm okay if you want to keep the Sabbath that way. That's perfectly fine. But it has nothing to do with that, because the word there is dot. Or data. Data is a decree. It has nothing to do with the Torah, the law that Moses wrote, or any of the laws or commandments of God that was given by Moses. But instead, it was a decree that the king had given. 
More specifically, the king that Artaxerxes C. Cyrus and Darius had given about the rebuilding of the second temple and the reestablishment of Jerusalem to send the Jewish people back to their homeland in order to see the coming of the Messiah, which was fulfilled just before the coming of Jesus Christ, their true Messiah, and the temple was in fact actually built. But oddly enough, we find that it was written by the very uh, prophet Daniel that there is going to come up a beast. A beast kingdom with the, the fourth one that would be more diverse from all the other kingdoms whatsoever. And he would speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, or the holy ones that is. And he shall think to change the seasons or the times and the decree. Law is really not the correct word. The decree. Three books in the Bible that uses that particular terminology, and that's the book of Esther when the king gave the decree, when Esther was part of that kingdom as the queen, when Vashti was thrown out and she was placed into there, and then, of course, in the book of Ezra and the book of Daniel, which specifically speaks about the building, the decree, going forth with the king to rebuild the second temple. Well, if this kingdom is going to take and try to change the time and the decree, he is basically going to be the one, and we know it's a latter kingdom, nothing to do with the time of during the, the, the Persian Empire at that time or the Babylonian Empire, because clearly Daniel was told by the angel it was for a time in the future. In other words, there would come a time in the future where someone would rise up and try to alter the decree that was given to rebuild the temple that was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And instead, now they got a new time and a new time for building of the temple, the third temple. And that's an evil beast kingdom. No wonder why they're setting up laws to annihilate Christians on a global scale. That should be horrifying in itself. Anyway, by the way, another thing that was interesting, Hamas did accept the ceasefire proposal. Plenty enough time before Israel decided to go in there anyway and attack Rafa after all. But all the propaganda that comes out on Twitter now about how they're, they're in there controlling everything. They're doing it just right. And I agree, Hamas no doubt has fired rockets right out of the Rafa area there, which has put the civilians in harm's way. Shame on Hamas for the evil that they're doing to put those people in harm's way. They don't care either. But after all, they're funded by Israel, so what do you expect? Israeli official Hamas proposal is unacceptable. So they go in there anyway. Doesn't matter. So now they come out with a question on RT. Will Rafa assault break Netanyahu? Israel's new large-scale offensive is being criticized over the world, but the PM may still turn the situation to his advantage. I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. It has been seven months since the tragic attack by the Palestinians' radical group on the Israeli territory. The strike was uncomparable to any other since the founding of the Jewish state in terms of the methods and the number of Israeli casualties. However, the Israeli response turned out to even be more tragic and aggressive. The interministerial Committee of Israel's 37th government, led by Benjamin Netanyahu, formed on October 11, 2023, to manage Israel's military operation in Gaza, increasingly threats, threatens to set the entire global community against the Jewish state. The situation worsened with the start of the Israeli military operation on a uh, densely populated city of Rafa in southern Gaza on the evening of May the 6th. The Israeli military reported that it was conducting targeted strikes on Hamas facilities in the eastern part of Rafa. The Israeli Air Force struck more than 50 targets in the city. According to the Times of Israel, citing Israeli Defense Forces IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari. He added that the strikes were carried out amidst the preparations for a military operation in the eastern part of Rafa. Hagar recalled that on the previous Monday, the IDF had ordered the evacuation of civilians from this part of the city. It is worth noting that currently, according to various sources, about 1.5 million refugees are in Rafa, having found shelter there after the start of the Israeli operation in northern Gaza. So where are they going to go? You tell them to evacuate, where are they going to go? I'll post the link for you so you can see for yourself. This is really a crime against humanity. And it's a beast kingdom. 
It's a beast system. It is a Daniel 7 prophecy in the making. What do you expect? And then they wonder why more. They, they keep worried about anti Sure, they have to pass a bill for anti-Semitism. They're creating so much hatred in the world by slaughtering people by the tens of thousands. Imagine that. By the tens of thousands. And they're just counted as animals. After all, they're only animals, they say. Well, you know, think about it. This is exactly why the Holocaust happened, because they were just, Jews were only just considered animals. If you dehumanize the population, it makes them very easy to exterminate. Why is it that Netanyahu's government is doing the exact same thing to the Palestinians that were done to the Jewish people in the Holocaust? If you ever look at the book, Holocaust victims accused, you may find out that the victims accused the Jewish leadership of their own massacre and demise. Would they be considered anti-Semitic based on the new law? Yes. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. We need some more Jeremiah's in this world today. Somebody that's willing to call out the crimes.